But do we all know what we're talking about when we're talking about trust? I mean, do we mean the same thing? And does trust really matter? Um, should trust matter in, indeed? Well, one person who's been trying to sort out these things for the last decade or so is my old friend, uh, co-author and uh, colleague, uh, Nick Wheeler, who since 2012, I think it was, uh, defected from Aberystwyth to go and work at the University of Birmingham. And uh, in the last couple of years, he's also been a senior fellow at um, BASIC, the Arms Control and Disarmament uh, think tank in London. And he's now one of the uh, leading thinkers about trust in the con context of international relations. So my first question to Nick is a biographical one, really. Uh, and that is, how did you develop, evolve from the time when I first you, knew you in the 1980s, when you were so focused on sort of hard strategic studies, as, as I saw it. And then in the 1990s, you evolved into the person who wrote Saving Strangers and a lot about the English school and good international citizenship and all that, and then developed into one of the leading thinkers about trust in international relations. That's a short, a short, a short <laughs> version. <laughs> short. Kind of you to put it in those terms, Ken. I, I should just begin by saying thank you to the organizers for giving us this opportunity. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a privilege. To, to have the chance to talk about your research in this way and your journey, which Ken has just sort of mapped out. And indeed, it, it, it's a privilege, Ken, to be doing it with you. Um, so how to start? I mean, I, I suppose two fundamental ideas have run together throughout my academic career with a specific sort of focus on nuclear weapons. So I think if I've got a sort of triangle of things going on in which I would locate trust, the first major idea that I think I encountered before even before I started as an undergraduate was that I read Hedley Ball's The Anarchical Society in the summer before I became an undergraduate because it was the core text for the LSE, which is where I thought I might be going uh, as one of the possibilities. And so I'd read, <laughs> I'd read the Anarchical Society. So I was introduced to the concept of international society at the beginning of my kind of academic journey. And then in the first term at North Staffordshire Polytechnic, where I actually did my undergraduate degree in international relations, uh, uh, because the A-levels didn't quite work out the way I'd hoped, um, I encountered the security dilemma and grew Robert Jervis's classic book, Perception and Misperception of International Politics. And I think the interrelationship, the, the conversation, the, um, the tensions between those two ideas has been something that I've run with kind of throughout my career. And so with this interest in nuclear weapons, because I wrote my PhD, as you know, on the British origins of nuclear strategy between 1945 and 55, using newly released papers in the National Archives or the Public Records Office, as it then was. And that was at Southampton, um, where I did my master's and my PhD, under the supervision of John Simpson and your old friend and colleague, uh, Phil Williams. So I had this interest in nuclear weapons, but that interest in nuclear weapons had been there also uh, earlier in my sort of life because um, I'd wanted to be a naval officer and all of this was sort of, so I had a big interest in, in navies and their relationship to nuclear weapons. And I used to sail a lot in the Solent with my father and family. And so I was sort of seeing all these ships and, 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 and stuff. And at the same time, the international situation appeared to be extremely threatening. So in the late seventies and the early eighties, when all this was taking place in my own sort of development, obviously we were in the kind of, uh, um, you know, the second cold war and all that. And so the interest in the security dilemma, international society, it came together uh, there. And what I was struggling for at my time at North Staffs and then Southampton was a way out of the box. How, how do we escape this so that we don't end up destroying ourselves? Is there a way for the United States and the Soviet Union to learn to live together peacefully? 
And so, in a sense, I was thinking about trust without realizing it all the way in the very beginning, because what I was really grasping towards was how can these states that are in this, these relationships of intense fear and competition, how can they actually escape the box? And the answer is trust. But it would take a, a, another 30 odd years or 20 odd years, 25 years, whatever it is, before that would come to fruition with you. Because of course, when I came to Aberystwyth in 85, uh, when I first met Ken, we started working together on the security dilemma. We started writing papers, we started going to conferences, uh, and we started work. And as you know, as we wrote that book over a rather long period of time, because we were both doing a lot of other things, um, we gradually came to realize that the key to all this was trust. Because the security dilemma fundamentally uh, is about uncertainty about the intentions of others. And the starting point for the traditional approach is that that creates fear and anxiety. And we're gonna have a paper later about anxiety. Um, and I'll be very interested to see sort of how that's being discussed. So what we were interested in was, could you think about the security dilemma in a way that took away that fear and anxiety and promoted cooperation and trust? And we started to realize as we wrote the book that the key to this was the development of trust. And that's how I got into trust. And then from there, you know, I then went on to write my own book, building on the work we'd done together uh, in 2018, which I've got the microphone resting on. Okay, thank you. Uh, you sorry, you can't. Okay, you were thinking about trust all these years, but you didn't know what you were thinking about, which um, leads very nicely to my first substantive question. Um, you know, back to basics. What is this thing called trust? What is it? Yeah, and if we can't define it, how can we have it? Mm -hmm. You put it in relation to security once. Um, well, the way I define it is expectations of no harm in a context where betrayal is always possible. So the, with trust, there's always risk. There's always vulnerability, but actors proceed on the basis that, that, that the trust they have in others will not lead them to be disappointed or betrayed. So trust always exists in conditions of uncertainty because if we had certainty, we wouldn't need trust. And it was that move that became crucial to us sort of developing our argument in the security dilemma, that uncertainty is not incompatible with a politics of trust and cooperation. So it's a willingness to be vulnerable. It's a psychological state that makes possible actions and behaviors that wouldn't be possible in the absence of that psychological state. It's always in relation to something. So, you know, I, I trust, you know, the way to, to bring my food and not to poison it and so on. Uh, but I don't necessarily trust that person with my daughter. Um, trust is always in relation to something and someone. So it's always, it's always uh, has to have a specific referent and um, it always involves the possibility of going wrong, but we always act on the basis or we, that it won't go wrong to varying degrees, which we can then kind of open up. So that's where I start. Right, you've opened up a couple of things there. Um, with the waiter example, um, you would mistrust that person um, perhaps, or you may distrust that person and I, I've noticed that in your work, and by the way, Nick and I, uh, our, the way Nick's put it so far is as if we are in complete agreement <laughs> and this is stuck over 30 years. It's, uh, it certainly hasn't. Uh, but, but the two words you've been using increasingly in the last few years are mistrust and distrust. So what's the difference between distrust and mistrust and why, why does it matter? I'd always thought of them like lots of people I think is synonymous, but you've been making a particular distinction between the two concepts. Yeah, so in international relations, people conflate them all the time. So um, most of the time, as you say, the discipline that we work in talks about mistrust. But if you, one of the key kind of features of my journey in trust has been the, um, the, the, the interest in trying to engage with disciplines outside of international relations. Um, 
and trying to see the, 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 the puzzle for me was there's an enormous amount of work on the, when we started this, when we finished the security dilemma in two, the book that we wrote together in 2008, Ken and I, I then wanted to sort of see where this whole trust project could go. And Jan was part of that story, which we'll probably come on to. And in particular, what I wanted to, to do was I wanted to see why there's all this work on trust outside of international relations. So you've got historians, you've got anthropologists, you've got economists, you've got business management, organization people, you've got ethicists, all these people writing about trust in really interesting ways and yet not applying it to the international level. Just, just not engaging. So, you know, I mean, just very quickly, you know, Rachel Botsman uh, uh, is a very, very interesting figure in uh, thinking about trust in, in, in public life. She's, she's on LinkedIn, you can follow her if you want. She's a professor at the Said Business School in Oxford. She's a very, very interesting public intellectual, you know. Um, and she wrote a book called Who Can You Trust? Which is a great primer on trust. I'd absolutely recommend anybody who wants to learn about this concept and get into it and to read her book. But, you know, she doesn't mention international relations. Just, just doesn't mention it um at all so i was really interested in why it was that these non-ir trust researchers didn't engage with the international but also was there something that we could learn from them that would help us to think about the international and what would happen if you tried to apply their kind of approaches to the international so it sort of got into that that conversation and through that i came to see that the non-international relations trust researchers and here i've got to make mention of my very good friend and colleague, Mark Saunders in the Birmingham Business School, uh, who really opened a lot of these doors for me. And in particular, this one about distrust. Non-international relations scholars, um, they make a clear distinction between trust and distrust. And they argue that the absence of trust is not necessarily distrust. So non-international relations trust scholars focus not on mistrust, they focus on distrust. And they set up distrust and trust for the most part as separate constructs. So the opposite of high trust is not uh, low, is, 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 not, is not then, uh, um, uh, you know, low distrust. Um, rather, trust and distrust are separate constructs. So you can have a situation where you don't have trust but neither do you have distrust. You have a space in between. Some of them call it ambivalence, some of them call it neutrality. And it's that space in between that I see as mistrust. So what I'm saying is that trust and distrust, and this is really important for thinking about policy issues that we may come on to talk about, um, need to be separated out because they've got different antecedents. And so we can have a situation where we, um, don't have distrust, but neither do we have trust. And in that situation, actors neither trust nor distrust, and they're, and they're in that zone of neutrality. And I think that's what we would understand by the security dilemma. So mistrust actually locks in really nicely to the concept of the security dilemma. Can I ask my question in a slightly different way in order to try and clarify what you just said. I remember when I was at school, the, one of the masters teaching English literature used to say, it's always very useful if you're trying to define a word uh, to find its opposite and define it in relation to its opposite. So what's the opposite of trust? Mistrust, distrust, neither, something else altogether? Or is that not a, a good way to think about a definition? So trust and distrust, in my thinking, share a fundamental functional similarity. So they have a functional similarity, which is they're both ways of managing uncertainty. So trust is an active belief that another party can be trusted. So you move out of the zone of uncertainty, you leave the security dilemma, and you move into the zone of trust, where you believe the other party is trustworthy and can be trusted. Okay, we might come back to that. So, but distrust is also an active belief that another party cannot be trusted. 
So it's also an active belief. It's also a way of managing uncertainty. So in that sense, they have a functional similarity, but they are, they are not, but that they are different constructs. So the things that you, the things that we need to understand in relation to how distrust comes about are different than the things that we need to understand in relation to how trust comes about. So they have a functional similarity, but they're separate constructs. That's the argument that I want to make. And as a result, it means that the things that you need to dissolve distrust are different from the things that you need to build trust. So does trust have an opposite? It has an opposite in the sense that um, there is, a, there is another side, that the, the same things that we have when we have trust, active beliefs, um, suspension of uncertainty, they have those characteristics in common, but they're not opposites in that sense because they are separate constructs. That's my, that's my argument. Okay. Let's, let's try and think about it in relation to IR theory. Let's focus on IR theory a bit more. Okay. In the last oh, 20 or 30 years, everybody, just about everybody who teaches uh, IR starts, shapes, shapes their courses and modules around the idea of different theoretical appro approaches or different schools and so on. It's become sort of an obsession. Um, which of the various schools, or at least the main schools of uh, IR theory, if any, do you think is most comfortable with the concept of, tr of trust, can do most with the concept of trust, or has done most with the concept of trust? Hmm. Well, I mean, in some ways, all of the mainstream approaches have, could be said to have a conception of trust. So, but it can be negative, but, but I think with some, obviously, it's very negative and with others, it's positive. So for, for, for realism, trust is something that they are extremely suspicious of, but they have a conception of it, which is that it's not possible. They have a conception of how trust fits into their picture of the world. So, for example, if you read Rosato's new book, Intentions in Great Power Politics, and Rosato is very much a Mearsheimer um, student, um, uh, he's arguing that rarely, if ever, can trust be achieved in great power relations. So he has a particular conception of trust from an offensive realist perspective. Uh, which is very negative. And that tends to be the default of, of the field is to assume that trust is not something that's possible. And indeed to reach after it is dangerous. But others within broadly um, a realist persuasion um, have been more open to the possibility. So the ra a rationalist like Andrew Kidd applying game theory Trust, and indeed that it is possible to develop trust in conditions of uncertainty, the security dilemma and so on through what he calls the reassurance game. But I mean, it, it, if we, but he has what I would call and what I call in my book, um, a calculative approach to trust where trust is, a, is based on a risk calculation. Uh, you're in Nick's casino and you're placing your bets. Uh, and, and then the extent to which you're willing to take those risks depends upon how far you think the other party um, can be trusted. And, and it's very much in this rational choice, um, game theoretic kind of approach. I mean, if we use, um, it, it, then if we think about, you know, I was thinking about the framework that uh, Vincent and Yan use in their 2015 article. If we move to the sociological kind of approach, which brings in constructivism, um, then we have, uh, approaches which are much more comfortable with trust, uh, which are starting to open up the idea that trust develops out of identity conceptions. 
So changing identity conceptions make possible new trusting relationships. Alex, Wen, Alex Wendt's work, of course, in social theory of international politics would be a really good example of this. Wendt thinks that trust is something that is a product of collective identity formations that can change over time, uh, and that this can be an antidote to uh, egoism and, and the possibility then of security communities and so on. So the constructivist approach, broadly speaking, and indeed the practice turn with the work of someone like uh, Vincent Poulier and others talking about trust as being something that's habitual, Torsten Michael's work within that space. Um, all of that is much more comfortable, I think, with ideas of trust. If you go into the normative realm, we think about uh, the work of someone like Aaron Hoffman in building trust. What's important there is you know, uh, this fiduciary idea of trust where we, 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 we expect those we trust to live up to the trust that we place in them. We make a moral judgment about, about that. And there, I think when you bring in the ethical realm, uh, we, we find a lot of approaches that are comfortable. And then the other way Jan and Vincent frame it is they have the rationalist approach that I've talked about with Kid. You have the sociological approach with the constructivisms, and then you talk about social psychological approaches. And there we could talk about the work of Brian Rathbun, 2012 book, Trust in International Cooperation, where Rathbun applies Eric Usner's idea of generalized and particularized trust to talk about multilateral security cooperation. Deborah Larson's classic 1997 book, Anatomy of Mistrust, bringing the social psychological approach to bear to explain missed opportunities for cooperation during the Cold War. Jonathan Mercer's work in a political psychology, international relations, looking at trust as an emotional belief. All of these approaches, I think, are comfortable. And you know, what I do in chapter one of my book is sort of set out these different approaches to trust research in international relations and explain their sort of strengths and uh, limitations as I see it. And as for yourself, you still set your feet in the English school um, back to the beginning. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, I think my approach is broadly constructivist. Um, and I very much see the English school with those constructivist roots as my good friend and our former colleague, Tim Dunn argued in his great essay all those years ago in, in the European Journal of International Relations, Social Construction of International Society. Yeah, I mean, I very much see my approach as constructivist. And crucially though, the challenge I've got with my work now, I think, or maybe it was always there, but is, is that I see trust as a mental state, as a psychological state. So not just as that, but I, but I see that as a critical part of the story of understanding trust. And I also think though, that those mental states, psychological states can change through social interaction. So I'm a social interactionist within the kind of broad constructivist approach. Um, and that's very much the arguments that are running through trusting enemies in the sense that I see trust as an emergent property of social interaction. So, so it's how do you then kind of bring together these, this idea of trust as a mental state, as a psychological state, uh, with this idea that uh, it's a product of social interaction. And that's kind of where my new book with Marcus Holmes is sort of trying to open that up. But broadly, yes, I would locate myself still in the English school, very much in the sense that I think the social world hangs together through a society of states. Um, I think, you know, that society is a varying strength in different regions. You know, we were talking over lunch about ASEAN. You see a deeper, you know, rooting of international society in some regions. And indeed, as Bull argued classically, you know, in the anarcho society, that changes historically as well. And it changes in the leaders, the individuals, and so on, as we were talking with Jenny this morning, you know, about different leaders, different approaches to these things. And as I was trying to suggest yesterday in relation to Nick, you know, we can have leaders who are more responsible in the way they approach nuclear weapons and leaders who are less responsible in the way they approach nuclear weapons. Although, you know, I take your point, Nick, you want to say that's still all under an umbrella of nuclearism. But I guess nuclearism can have, I mean, it's interesting with Hedley Bull, you know, Bull, Bull's empirical focus was nuclear weapons. And indeed, you know, one of the books that I guess very few people read these days, but, you know, his first book in 1961 was, of course, Control of the Arms Race, product of this Chatham House, uh, double IWS study group that he was the rapporteur for. 
and and he spent you know his entire life thinking about nuclear issues and nuclear challenges in the context of international society okay trust is a relationship which is very neat because the next two phrases i've got here is levels of analysis and structures and agents which are common phrases to think about international relations so let's look at trust in relation to levels of analysis and structures and agents can trust exist between big complex structures like states or governments or can trust only exist between individual people <laughs> yeah pleasure is um i i thought yeah and, and that's good because we share a lot in common as well on this um I've always been uncomfortable with this idea that you can talk about the United States trusting or distrusting the Soviet Union. I've, I've, I have a problem with the idea that you can talk about the University of Birmingham trusting the University of St. John's, York. I don't think collectives trust in, in, in that sense that we, in that sense, I have, I have a problem with that. Now, I don't have any problem with the idea that individuals can trust in collectives. So I might trust Facebook or I might distrust Facebook or I might trust the airline that's taking me to wherever, hopefully I might be going on holiday in a few weeks time. Um, you know, you can impute perceptions of trustworthiness or untrustworthiness to collectives. But I have a problem with the idea that collectives can trust. So um, two moves followed from that. First of all, I was really interested, as you know, when we wrote the Security Dilemma book, we, we did a lot of stuff on what Gorbachev called the human factor. We got very interested in kind of the, the role of these individuals at crucial moments, and we have lots of interesting stuff in our book about that. But we didn't really theorize it. it. It wasn't clear when that happened and when it didn't happen. And so what this book tried to do, which I've always said is volume two, and it grows out of the Security Dilemma book, and you know I dedicated it to you for everything you've done, in, bringing me to that point in my journey. And um, what I wanted to do in the book was really examine interpersonal trust. Because I felt, you know, I want, I, I, you know, the, the feminist uh, idea that the personal is the political, you know, I, 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 that seems to me, has always seemed to me ever since I sort of first encountered it as a really, really powerful way of kind of thinking about uh, international relations. But I was really struck by the idea that we needed to also think about the interpersonal. And that, so that's why I called the introduction to my book, uh, The Interpersonal is the International. Because I wanted to explore the idea that interpersonal trust really mattered. Now, people had looked at interpersonal trust outside of international relations. There was some interesting work. Weber and Carter's book, for example, on personal relationships, I think is a really great book. And that really inspired me in lots of ways. But no one had looked at the interpersonal um, in relation to adversarial relationships at the international level. And that was the opening for this book. Um, so interpersonal, I wanted to put interpersonal trust on the map in international relations. That's really what I wanted to do. And with a particular intention to um, answer a fundamental puzzle and signaling theory that we may get into. But I, so I wanted to, to do that. So it wasn't my purpose in this book to kind of really talk about um, those questions that you've raised directly, but obviously I had to position myself. And Laura's not here, but it was my privilege to supervise Laura uh, at ABBA. And Laura was, when Laura started to get into trust research, um, she, she had this really great chapter where she showed how lots and lots of trust researchers in the field had just been really sort of um, uh, imprecise in the way they talked about levels. So, you know, they would talk about governments, they would talk about leaders, they would talk about states. And she identified this problem of the sort of the referent issue. And, and I draw attention to that. And, you know, Jan and Vincent have been explicit in their work about their reference as the state level. And I wanted to be clear that, you know, my reference was the interpersonal level. So, so that was, that was really important in terms of setting it up. But 
but interpersonal in the sense of these individuals, of course, are not just individuals who are um, you know, operating in a private capacity, they're individuals who are acting on behalf of these sovereign states that can mobilize enormous amounts of military power. That can, you know, they're, they're embedded in a whole set of governmental constraints and, and enablements. And so it, it, that's where the English school was coming in, the sort of the Manning and the Bull kind of influence was sort of coming in there in the sense of these individuals are not are individuals who are speaking and acting on behalf of states in a society of states. Okay, I, that's a big question, uh, a long answer. Um, and I think um, other people might want to raise this issue because it is a cen central issue, but I'm conscious of the time uh, moving on. So I will move on uh, and simply say that whether we're talking about states or whether we're talking about individuals, change is the essence of life. And there isn't there an inherent unpredictability about trust when we think about trust as possibly a basis or contributor to international order. You know, leaders move on leaders might develop a chemistry with a particular, as it's sometimes put, with a, a, another, another leader of another state. But the two leaders look over their shoulder and they've got advisors who are telling them to do other things rather than yeah. uh, you know, be impressed by the fact that they come away from a negotiation and say, oh, well, there's real chemistry between us two, blah, blah, blah. Chemistry produces explosions as well as you know, deep emotions. Um, Governments change, uh, states reset their interests because of circumstances changing. So, you know, why on earth depend upon this psychological state, this chemistry uh, as a basis of international order? Shouldn't we be looking for something a bit more solid? Yeah, I think there are three responses. So first of all, I want to argue that in deep adversarial relationships where two states are locked into an enemy relationship, the interpersonal may offer a route to um, dissolve that conflict. So it's about the, the fundamental problem with the field as I see it, or as I saw it when I came to write this book, um, was that no one had really come up with a good theory of how trust develops in adversarial situations. So that's what I tried to provide. Um, so in, in, the importance of, uh, I, mean, I mean, the case study that kind of, you know, has always animated me ever since we started kind of, well, no, really ever since I lived through it. I mean, the case that, I mean, we lived through it you know, when we first met and, and that period um, has been the Reagan Gorbachev case. And, and so much of my, theoretical kind of edifice is built on that experience of what I think happened between those two leaders. So, so that's the, the first argument is that I think the interpersonal is a really important way in, right? To, to, to breaking down the adversarial. Then you come on to your really important points. I'll take those in two ways. So first of all, even if you can build an interpersonal relationship of trust between two leaders in an adversarial context, can they be successful in convincing those around them to change course and to do the things that they want to do? That's a great question. So Reagan and Gorbachev, yes, they were able to do that. They had what I call uh, capacity, trust as capacity to, to, to do that in relation to, so trustworthiness um, uh, re, re, in the non-IR literature, people talk about trustworthiness in terms of three attributes that those who are gonna do the trusting look for in those that they're trusting. That's ability, which uh, benevolence and integrity. Um, I cashed out ability in IR as capacity, preferred that way of thinking about it. Benevolence I thought was too demanding. So I wanted to talk about peaceful intent, which links to the security dilemma and then integrity. So um, So the, the question is, if you've got that level of trust between two leaders, can they convince their, their, their domestic uh, constituencies to 
to stay with them. And Reagan and Gorbachev were able to in that period that they interacted. But for example, the case study that I'm working on in my new book with Marcus is the one that I mentioned briefly this morning between Rajiv Gandhi and Benazir Bhutto. That's a really great case study because I think they had the chemistry and the trust, but neither of them were able to translate it into tangible gains in terms of de-escalating the India-Pakistan uh, confrontation. Coming back to some of the points you were making this morning about India and Pakistan. So that's a real problem. But, um, if you can't then sell it domestically. Now, again, in the India-Pakistan context, uh, the Indian leader, Vajpai, uh, BJP leader, and Nawaz Sharif, uh, Pakistan leader, they met at Lahore in February 1999, and they signed nuclear confidence and security building measures that to this day are the most comprehensive between the two states, and indeed um, are still in existence between the two states. Um, but, and they began to um, um, make serious steps towards trying to come up with a solution to Kashmir. But the Pakistani military were extremely uncomfortable with what Sharif was doing. And they undertook covertly a military operation to attack Indian positions at Cargill, leading to a nuclear crisis uh, between the two states. So Sharif was unable to control his domestic uh, actors, the most powerful domestic actors in this case. And Bajpai was able to control his, but it wasn't enough. And then with Benazir and Rajiv, neither side were able to control their actors. So that's the, so that problem is, 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 is a, difficult one, but then you've posed an even harder one that I freely admit is the biggest problem, which is, you know, the future uncertainty problem. So Trump comes into power and he basically, in May 2018, he pulls out of the Iran nuclear deal. Obama has spent most of his second term, you know, negotiating and, and getting this deal. So what it how can we build order on the basis of interpersonal trust? The answer is we can't, but we can't build order without interpersonal trust in adversarial situations. So the question then is, the challenge is, how do you build a bridge from interpersonal trust to a deeper institutionalization of trust and ultimately that spreading so I, the solution to the future uncertainty problem, I think, is the idea of a security community. So how do you get the, how do you build the bridge from interpersonal trust that seems to be really crucial, I would argue, in adversarial contexts, can be, it's not guaranteed, of course, no guarantees here, um, to um, security communities. Because security communities seem to institutionalize trust and, and they open up the idea that it's not then dependent upon particular constellations of interpersonal relationships. But I don't want to, I don't want to go and jettison the interpersonal and say, well, you know, because it doesn't always last and because new leaders are going to come along, that means we just don't want to look at the interpersonal because the interpersonal actually opens up a space for de-escalating conflicts in the present and reducing the risks of nuclear conflict. Right. <laughs> Uh, you, I'm conscious of the time. I think we should finish in about five minutes okay. and throw it uh, open. Um, so just a couple of other questions mm -hmm. with, and maybe somewhat deeper answers, answers if you don't mind. Sorry. You've, you've just mentioned quite a few leaders and the historical situations. I wanted to ask you about empirical work um, and the problems of empirical work. But without giving any illustrations, can you sort of give us a checklist of doing empirical work on this thing called trust? It's very difficult. <laughs> um, it's very difficult for a number of reasons. So first of all, it's very difficult because access to the materials is very difficult. So um, one of the case studies in the new book is Trump and Kim. But you know, we even though you know it's four years on. We still don't have very much material on that, really. In fact, I'm doing an interview next week with someone who is involved. And, you know, interviews clearly become very important uh, in that. Um, but so if we look back to 1985, you know, when you and I first met, 
when Reagan and Gorbachev met in Geneva in November 1985, no one at the time knew where that was going to lead. And indeed, you know, I don't remember us at the time thinking this was a groundbreaking summit and we're in a fundamental new order, because it's equally possible that that summit could have been a disaster or that summit could have gone off in a very, or, or after that summit, things could have gone off as they certainly could have done in a very different direction. So there's always the problem of, you know, this, uh, of looking backwards with, you know, driving with the rear view mirror. And that's a real problem with trust research. So when we talk about things in the present, when people ask me about, you know, I wrote an op-ed last year with Marcus about the Biden-Putin meeting, and it hasn't dated very well, really. And, and, and you know, it, it, uh, so, and it's a problem when we're talking about trust in the contemporary period. So we need a lot of documents. So access is a problem. But even working on things like Benazir and Rajiv, it's difficult to get access to the archives in these places. So then you're more dependent on interview material, but then how much reliance can you place on interviews that you're doing with people now about things years later? You know, I once met McNamara, you know, um, um, yeah, as you did, and, you know, we had lunch and he was talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis and he was saying, you know, Jack did this and Jack did that. And I was thinking, is that really what happened or is that because he's read dozens of books since the crisis, he's been talked to by so many researchers who've told him that these things, how much is this really McNamara telling me what happened in 1962 on that day? And how much is this actually McNamara 40 years later or 30 years later, whatever it was, telling me, you know? Um, so, so I think that's a real problem. And then the other problem is I rely a lot on memoirs and all sorts of statements of the leaders themselves. And Jan's gonna say, you can't rely on discursive expressions of trust. Um, and I think it's a problem. So what we need, final point on methodology here, what we need is we need some kind of theory that gives us uh, observable implications of the things that we wanna see. So we need something to go <laughs> alongside all that um, discursive data that we can say, okay, what, was it, what would it be then that we would need to see in order to disqualify the claim that this was trust? And that's what I tried to do in the book. Nobody comes out badly out of their own memoirs, yeah. I think, uh, as a generalization. Yeah. In order to get grants these days, you've got to do multidisciplinary work. It, has that been helpful? I think it's been incredibly helpful to be involved with people outside of international relations thinking about trust. And as you know, we tried to bring those people together for a conversation. Yam was part of that, of course. On, on nuclear issues. I, th I think that yielded a lot, but I think for me, over looking back over 15 years of engagement with this multidisciplinary space, my work has been transformed enormously by that. And I think the opportunity to work with non-IR trust researchers, just to list a few like Mark, Saunders, Guido Mollering, Uta Freyvert, uh, you know, um, Marek Cohn, Jeffrey Hosking, this is across all different disciplines. Chance to work with these people, um, for me, has been really enriching. And I think that, you know, that's something that I continue to be very open to and engaged with, is the idea that we can learn from other disciplines. But there's always the, but, but I think, you know, what, what I'm always trying to do with it is, is bring it back to international relations. Okay, how does this help? And that's where the work on distrust is so interesting because we're, we're trying to look at dissolving distrust. Dissolving distrust, because the thing that neither we didn't do, nor I haven't done in this book, is really uh, drill down into the things that need to be done to actually dissolve distrust. And I think that's the next big agenda, as I said yesterday, in relation to Nick's paper. Yeah. What might a politics of trust look like? Going back to the discussion uh, yesterday and on nuclear weapons, how would you try and persuade, how would you try and persuade a near nuclear power living in an unstable part of the world, say the Middle East, in a world after Putin is successful, if he were to be successful and have a win in Ukraine, how would you try and persuade that person to pursue um, the emotion of 
and, and psychological uh, roots of trust rather than investing in nuclear missiles. I mean, how do you how do you do a politics of trust? Well, I think I think there's a fundamental problem problem in the premise of your question. I I've never argued that trust is uh, a solution to every situation that we face in international relations. You know, this is a slight maybe this is a bit of a sort of uh, evading it slightly, but. The fundamental point is that we should only trust the trustworthy. Oh, Nora O'Neill has that line, trust the trustworthy. So we sh certainly shouldn't trust the untrustworthy. So if we really believe that we're in a situation where uh, the other party has malign intent towards us, uh, and um, we see ourselves in a relationship of distrust, which is not misplaced, it's not driven by misperceptions at the heart of the security dilemma idea, then nuclear weapons might be the appropriate response. Um, a politics of trust doesn't necessarily mean that you have to, you know, it, it, a politics of trust can only be pursued in a context where both parties ultimately are open to the idea that they see their security as bound up with the security of the other. I mean, it's what you, know, you wrote about, you know, long time ago you know common security the importance of mutual security the importance that ultimately and so so to those people i wouldn't advise them necessarily to not to have nuclear weapons now one of the things we wrote about in our book was this idea of the leap in the dark and i um this idea that leaders might make dramatic bold moves to uh, transform situations and, and I'm very interested in, in, the, in that as an empirical phenomena. When we see those bold moves, we see them a lot less than we might think. Um, and I'm interested in the consequences of that. But I'm also very clear now uh, that when you make a bold move of that kind, you're not acting from a position of trust. You're acting in the belief that you might be able to conjure the trust up through the bold move. So you're you're showing yourself, you're making yourself so vulnerable that you're hoping to transform the game. If you go, if you make a bold move from a position of trust, it's not a bold move. Because if you really believe that, that the other party isn't going to uh, exploit you, then, then you, don't, you don't see yourself as taking on that vulnerability in that way. Others on the outside might say, wow, that's a very vulnerable thing you did. But it's only vulnerable if you don't believe you're in a trusting relationship. So, but if you're not in a trusting relationship and you're in a situation like you've just said, and then you don't develop nuclear weapons, that would be a leap in the dark. But the additional proliferation of nuclear weapons, does this not create a context in which the prospects for trust building get, get smaller? Yeah, which is why I think, which is why I was trying to suggest yesterday, we have to we have to change the dial towards focusing on dissolving distrust as a precondition for the development of trust. So trust building remains the greatest challenge for us in the nuclear space. Um, but in order to get to trust building, we've got to go through distrust to dissolving. So we've got to break down the distrust. The, the problem at the moment is lots of people say, oh, okay, if only the five permanent members of the Security Council, the nuclear weapon states recognized under the treaty, if only they'd all agree no first use. If only they'd, um, you know, the people come up with all these ideas of what they could do. But the problem is those ideas only make any sense in a context where they're not in a deep politics of distrust. And unfortunately, we are in a deep politics of distrust at the moment. Distrust among the P5, I don't think has been greater than it is today for a long, long time. And, you know, we've heard a lot about Russia in the last couple of days. I mean, the, I, how you begin to think about this, maybe you can't break down distrust between Russia and us because maybe at the moment, we're just in a world where we are in a very, very deep relationship of distrust, and it may be it's the right response. So I don't want to be read as saying that I think trust is always available to us. However, 
there are cases historically, and I think there are cases potentially in the present, and there will be in the future, where misplaced fear and suspicion can get us into all sorts of problems that we could potentially have avoided if we had a better understanding of the way in which um, the security dilemma operates in international relations. I think that's a good place to finish. Um, I throw it open to the audience. Yeah. You're at the front. You? Yeah. Um, so, you, if I understood it correctly, you said that. Sorry, I, I'm not hearing the no, mic. Can't hear. Okay, so. That's better. Thanks. Um, you said that the main question that we need to answer is that how do we build trust? Yeah. So I was thinking that maybe we can look at trust as an emotion. And if we did that, uh, looking at the international relations psychology research, you can say that certain emotions can be built by um, enacting certain cues. So if you see trust as an trust as a process of, let's say, belief in the other state over time. So how could we create this emotion of trust? And then from building this emotion of trust, we can maybe find out, all right, so the state leaders trust each other. So how do you make the mass people trust each other, like in India and Pakistan case? And then, I, I guess that those two would have the issue that you'd have to somehow analyze the trust in millions of people and what they think and be able to analyze all of that data. But did that make any sense? I'm sorry. Thanks. I think I've got, I think I've got some of that. Um, so first of all, um, I think it's really important to think about um, Ken asked me about you know multidisciplinary inquiry. One of the uh, pri 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 privileges and pleasures of the last few years has been working at Birmingham with Teresa Capellas, who is the president currently of the International Society for Political Psychology, and indeed she's at the annual conference in Athens today, um, leading that. Um, and she's we've done a lot of work together on thinking about the emotions and trust because she's a, a world leading authority on. On, on, on emotions and psychology issues. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it, it is a really interesting question whether trust is an emotion. Jonathan Mercer's work is a really, really good kind of uh, place to go for this kind of discussion because he talks about trust as an emotional belief. And he's interested in how emotions and beliefs kind of um, uh, constitute, how, how, how emotions and beliefs mutually constitute one another and how these this idea of an emotional belief is that um, our, our emotions then kind of reinforce these beliefs that we have so they so they constitute these beliefs and they, and they reinforce them so trying to think about trust as an emotional state I think is is, is, is important because what she would say if she was here is that you can't distinguish ultimately between cognition and emotion and the work of people like Damasio and so on has kind of very much been making this argument about what political psychologists call hot cognition. So the idea that all of our cognitive beliefs are ultimately um, constituted and reinforced by our, emotional, by, by our emotions. So what, what does that mean for trust though? Well, my argument is that trust emerges out of a, a process of social interaction. And it's an emergent property. But, but what does that mean to talk about it emerging out of a process of social interaction? Well, for me, what's critical to that is that there's a transformation takes place. So when, when these two leaders meet for the first time, uh, on my theory, they, they start out with one another with an openness to the possibility that the other is trustworthy. But they don't know at that point. They're, they're open to it. They've exercised what Ken and I call security dilemma sensibility. And that's what's got them in the room. 
And now they're looking to test it out. They're looking to find out. And I argue that what has to happen during that process is their identities have to transform. And they have to transform together. So it is a chemistry point. Something has to happen in this inter their interaction in the same way that in our own personal relationships, we can all think about these dynamics happening. And if that happens, then we get a new identity, a new collective identity forms between these two individuals. And that's an emotion, that's an emotional state because their mental states are now very different from what they were when they started. And at the heart of that for me is what Gorbachev called the human factor. He said it came into operation between him and Reagan. And then he proceeded, and, and Reagan said the same. And they, they were able to develop through this process of humanization, something very different. So now I think that process happened between the Indian and Pakistani leaders, it, uh, I document in my book in 98, 99, but it didn't happen between those people that weren't party to that process. So in my new book with Marcus Holmes, the, the fundamental problem is who's inside the bonding process and who's outside it. So in this book, I talk a lot about interpersonal, um, uh, I talk, talk a lot about interpersonal interaction leading to the development of social bonds. In our new book, we talk about this process of social bonding. We've written an article setting out the theory of social bonding in diplomacy uh, that's in the journal International Theory. And, and so the question then is, how do you extend those bonds to others? Now, with the India-Pakistan case, the problem was that the bonding process didn't get beyond the leaders. But if it could have got beyond the leaders, if it could have embraced others, then could it go wider? Could, could the bonding process ultimately radiate outwards into the societies themselves? And what other groups and movements, this comes back to Nick's point about counter-hegemonic blocks yesterday and transnational solidarities and trying to think about the idea of, you know, uh, movements coming, coming up from below, can social bonding then kind of radiate from above and below to create transformational possibilities? And the answer is yes. And the answer is we have an empirical example of that and it's Western Europe after 1945. The European project was both top down and bottom up. It was top down because we had visionary leaders in Adenauer, Monet, uh, uh, Schumann. We had these leaders who saw a different future and who wanted to grasp that future and who took some risks and who built trust. But we also had lots and lots of uh, op of, of um, transnational cooperation taking place. School children from Germany visiting France, school children from France visiting Germany, Adenauer taking mass with de Gaulle at Rheims Cathedral, ne kneeling down and praying with each other as, an as, as a stunning act of symbolic atonement, stunning act of atonement, symbolism. Walking out of the theater, uh, theater, sorry, walking out of the church, the cathedral, walking out of the cathedral arm in arm, and, and then, you know, showing the world this stunning kind of reconciliation. So emotions are at the heart of that, kneeling down together, praying, all of that. So yeah, emotions are right at the heart of this subject of ours of international relations. And indeed, you know, one of the limitations of the field in, historically has been the neglect of the emotional. So you bring up a really important point. Sorry, I'm answering far too long. Sorry, yeah. Ken. I'll try and be a bit quicker. Right, the two questions at the back. One of you start and then we'll pass it on. I'll start simply because my question really leads on from the last. And that is, uh, you talked about trust. Uh, what causes um, distrust? Uh, it is emotion, isn't it? It's the fear. In the realist world, we acknowledge that fear is the emotion uh, that drives relationships, drives behaviors. Um, and at this university, which uh, specializes in religion, why don't we think about the difference between fear and faith? Surely the antidote to fear, at least in theory, has to be faith. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be religious faith, but any faith that uh, 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 enjoins a higher purpose, a trust in perhaps a higher power, uh, 
is that possibly a starting point? Um, but whilst we look at that big picture, I think it's well worth exploring many of the, the limitations of some of the examples perhaps that we've looked at. Um, there have been uh, some incredible advances in trust building. I, I'm thinking of the Open Skies Agreement that uh, uh, Dame, um, um, what, what's her name? <laughs> um, uh, somebody I worked with very closely, whose name just escapes me, will come back to me. Um, uh, and also, if we look at, for example, the SALT Treaty, um, for those of us who witnessed on NATO bases, as I did, um, access to NATO bases uh, in the UK and elsewhere to Soviet military people to come and inspect. That's phenomenal. That's almost unthinkable. So we have had uh, trust building measures where there's been mutual benefit. What hasn't happened is to take this to the stage where um, some of the ingrained assumptions which emanate from the um, Western, uh, if you like, mindset have been challenged. Uh, and, and a lot of that is this idea of the state of nature and that fear, uh, distrust of the other. And I just want to finish that question because illustrating the, the Western mindset, you've just uh, mentioned, Ken, if I may so, uh, use your example, the unstable parts of the world. True to an extent, uh, there are parts of the world where there are tremors of instability. But look at it from the other parts of the world. There has been nowhere in Earth that has been more unstable than Europe that has inflicted two world wars, a third war which, which it calls Cold War, but which has led to the death of millions of innocents in Africa, in South America, and in Asia, where Western-inspired conflict is exported. So what I'm trying to point at is if we are going to look at uh, fear, let's look at the causes of fear, which are geographically at least central to uh, the Western world, and let's question radically whether fear can be overcome by faith. Okay. Uh, thank you. That's a really interesting question and intervention. Um, so one, one argument is that the European security community uh, is there by virtue of the exploitation and misery of those in the global south. So that's a kind of um, sort of neo-Marxist, Tarek Bakawi uh, at the LSE is someone who's kind of articulated these kind of arguments and, and but I just pick him out as one obvious one that jumps to mind. So th that is an interesting argument. I don't personally give too much credence to that because I think the Western European security community uh, doesn't depend upon those, those practices for its continuation, which is the claim that some people want to make that it's so it, that we've only got it by virtue of those uh, practices of uh, exploitation and so on and the exporting of violence essentially, essentially to the global south. That doesn't mean I don't think that there's the export of violence to the global south, but it means I don't think it's necessarily instrumental in the production and reproduction of the European security community. But I, but I think that's, a, that's a, it's a, it's an interesting, important point to bring us to that, to recognize the interrelationship. I think your early, the first point you made though is a really powerful one. And I think I hinted at this yesterday in passing. And Alex Went makes this point uh, well in his book too. Um, Europe had to go through the Second World War and indeed the First World War, but, but both world wars in order to arrive at the point where it was willing to invest in or to, to make that leap, if you want, of imagination to what becomes this, the European Union and the European security community. And so without the crucible of global war, uh, would that project have been possible? And that casts a really depressing shadow, of course, over all of these conversations. Someone mentioned Kant this morning, I think George mentioned Kant and perpetual peace. Ken knows this better than me, but I think Kant argued 
that history sometimes moves forward through, uh, you know, human catastrophe. And, and in the nuclear age, um, a number of uh, strategists, including I think Herman Kahn, um, have argued that if you ever were to get rid of nuclear weapons, it would probably only happen in the context of a situation where there'd been some kind of nuclear conflict. And indeed, a lot of science fiction kind of starts from there. Just very quickly on your other points about open skies and salt, I think it's important to make a distinction between trust and verification. So Reagan said, trust but verify. But in doing that, of course, he conflated the two. And fundamentally, the more you need to verify, the more you need to fly open skies and have all that transparency, the less trust you actually have. So it may well be that you get to verification uh, uh, arrangements, but you get there often through trust having already been developed. So in the case of INF, I would argue strongly, you needed a prior foundation of trust between Reagan and Gorbachev before you could actually get the agreements on the INF verification, which was massively uh, unprecedented in terms of the level of intrusiveness. You didn't get that first and then the trust. You got the trust first. And if you want to pursue that further, I'd invite you to read chapter six of Trusting Enemies. <laughs> Okay. Thanks. Um, so you've actually ended on on one question that I wanted to ask, which is Ken asked earlier, what is the opposite of trust? And I remember being at dinner with a friend of mine a few months ago, and he said, the antithesis of trust is not distrust, it's transparency. And we want transparency, we want verification when we don't have trust. And I wonder how that plays into your argument and i have to say i have no answer because six months i've been thinking about this and i still don't know um that's a great question and related to that and it goes to to one of the questions you've just been asked which is what is the distinction between trust and confidence ah, so really so something that that was just described about verification i would describe as confidence building measures not trust building measures and I think there's possibly a useful dis differentiation, but I don't know what that differentiation would be. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, and then there's something else that you mentioned of trust as a psychological state. And my, my question is hopefully got a simple answer. My assumption would be that trust is an outcome of a different psychological state rather than a psychological state in and of itself. But this may be that I've assumed something about trust that maybe is, is not true. These are, these are great questions. I was really hoping someone wouldn't ask me about the distinction between trust and confidence. But your first, you know, I really like that, that the, because I mean, the, the fundamental way that we tend to explain the difference between uh, trust and, and other um, ways of managing uncertainty is that trust involves a situation where you don't monitor and control people. And the more we want to monitor and control people, and the more we want this level of transparency, the less trust we have. Rachel Botsman's really good on this, actually. She's very good on a lot of her newsletter things where she explores some of these issues. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's, I like that, that the opposite of trust is transparency. There's something, there's something really um, interesting there to kind of play with uh, and to think about because it's not distrust for me, because as I've said, they've got these functional similarities, but they've got these different antecedents, which seems to mean that we need to different interventions to build one and to understand how we dissolve the other. That's kind of where my new work is going alongside my book with Marcus. So, so I like that a lot. Okay, then your next question is tricky, right? So actually, let me do psychological state first and then finish on confidence. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Trust is a psychological state, which is a different psychological state to the one that you're in. So for example, distrust is a psychological state. And, and, and distrust, coming back to what, sorry, what's your name? Avi, coming back to what Avi was saying about fear. Distrust is a psychological state that is dominated by fear, suspicion, and the need for vigilance. So monitoring is really, really high in a distrusting world. So we're looking for very high levels of verification because we don't because we don't trust and we're in this state of distrust so but when we get into trust 
then we're in a very different psychological state. And I would argue in that state, we're in a world which is what Jan and Vincent talk about when they talk about no need to hedge, but they're applying it to the state level. I'm applying it to the interpersonal level, but we both agree on this. They're in a world where they're not calculating the risks of others defecting against them. Um, so, so there's no kind of hedging going on in relation to that one party that you're, that person that you're, you're bonded with. So yeah, I think that's really important. Okay, trust and confidence. Here we go. So I like Nicholas Luhmann's distinction between trust and confidence, but I'm still not entirely clear how it plays out at the international level. So Luhmann says that what trust and confidence have in common is that you can be disappointed. But when it, but when it comes to confidence, you don't expect to be disappointed. Because like, for, so you're walking along the road, taking a stroll, you don't expect the cars, Lumen says, to come flying off the road, or you expect the post to be de delivered. So you have this confidence, whereas trust presupposes a situation of risk. And the crucial distinction for Lumen is that that situation of risk is one that you've chosen to enter into. So you, you've, you've taken the decision to accept those risks knowing that you didn't have to accept those risks whereas you can't control for the cars so so that's the distinction people want to make between trust and confidence so for so the classic examples they use you know like a babysitter for example you know you you, you by having a babysitter look after your baby you you take a risk when you go out for the night that your baby is going to be okay but you don't have to take that risk you don't have to go out Whereas with confidence, you, you can be disappointed, but you're not expecting to be disappointed in any way. You're not expecting to be disappointed with trust, but you've, but you've made a decision with trust where there's a situation of risk, even though if you know the babysitter really well and you trust the babysitting circle or what, you know, whatever it is, or you, you're very, very bonded with the person, then you don't expect there to be any problems, which is, for me, as I say, my definition of trust. So what does that mean then in terms of confidence building measures and trust building measures? Well. Confidence building measures can exist, I think, in terms of what they do is they, they reduce your uncertainties about the intentions of others, but they do it by giving you information and knowledge, which you think then makes you more secure. But what they don't do is confidence and security building measures don't build relationships of trust in the interpersonal sense, because what, what they may become they're often things that come out of that, but they're not themselves ways of building trust. What they do is they give you more knowledge about the intentions of others, but that knowledge might be false. They might be deceiving you. It doesn't give you a relationship of trust. So I think you're right. Trust building measures need to be distinguished from confidence building measures. And that's why what's really interesting, and this, this is a puzzle that I've kind of been having around in my head for decades, for a long time now, but I haven't found a way ultimately to kind of really resolve it satisfactorily. But if you look at all the communiques that the state leaders and diplomats and principals issue, it's all about building trust and confidence. And in the international level, we conflate them. You talk to anybody in the Foreign Office, Ministry of Defense about this stuff, they, they talk about building trust and confidence, but there's no, there's no kind of reflexivity here that these things might actually be very different. And so I think this is where the non-international relations people have got interesting things to say, and we need to think about what it means for the international level. But the great, great, great set of questions to end on. And hopefully I did them reasonable <laughs> justice. Thanks, Nick. We've got just over five minutes. So can I see how many others? One, two, can we keep? And we'll take take them all, and can we keep them short, please? Are you giving up your? You well, since you were holding it, keep it.
Um, hey, Richard. So we'll see hand up down this side. Is this the last one? Anybody else? No, this is. Okay, well, I think Jan. you should. Okay. <laughs> I think you should. For the benefit of the room, I think you should. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Try and keep it PC. Sorry, who was the figure that you talked about? 
No, no, sorry, the, the fear is that you meant. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or just use your big voice. Yeah, no, so Vincent and I, of course, resolved the issue of trust and confidence. Uh, you can calculate confidence, you can't calculate trust. Uh, consequently, uh, trust reduces uncertainty, confidence doesn't. Uh, that's the simple way to put it. My question, if I may just abuse since I have the mic, is Nick, you started that you wanted to escape the box and you thought trust was the way out. And uh, you finished by saying, quote, trust is not always available to us. So uh, how does that square with each other? Uh, characteristically thought provoking. So excellent. Thanks very much to you both. Okay, great. Can I just throw in a yeah, at the why end, don't you? And it was a response to the idea that the opposite of trust is transparency. I thought of another word, but I can't quite think through all the reasons why it's a better one than the others on option. And that is deception. I wonder if the opposite of truth is deception. But anyway, Nick. Wow. Okay. Just take a few because we're at three o'clock. Yeah. Okay. So, Isla, I think integrity is fundamentally important. And the thing is, you, it's so much more difficult to repair trust after it's broken than to build it in the first place. And Johnson's, I think, fundamental problem was, of course, that the people were prepared to maybe make an allowance on one go. But when it just kept coming and coming and coming, it, 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 you know, ultimately that was just too much. I mean, the lying thing is really interesting. Mia Scheimer, of course, wrote this book, Why Leaders Lie, which is an intriguing book given you know, his general theory of international relations. But there's, there's, I think integrity is fundamentally important. I, I've got a fantastic slide by um, George Schultz, who just a couple of weeks before he died, celebrated his 100th birthday. Schultz got this. It was, it was in the New York Times, a piece he wrote about trust. But there's a fantastic kind of paragraph where he says, you know, when trust was in the locker room, when trust was in the university, when trust was in the armed forces, you know, everything was okay. But when trust wasn't there, then it all fell apart. And from someone like him, I thought that was really, really interesting that he made that reflection about trust at the end of his life in that way. That, you know it was fun it was he calls it the coin of the realm which is just a fantastic kind of way of thinking about it so i think integrity fundamental um but you may you raise just very quickly you you raise a, something that often comes up in these conversations but and that's the role of power lumen interestingly wrote a book about trust and power he didn't sort of fuse them together but he he wrote a book that half the books about trust and half the books about power uh, which is kind of intriguing, but he, but one of the fundamental problems is asymmetries of power. How can trust flourish in relationships where there's massive asymmetries of power? And I think that speaks to the post-colonial agenda. And just very quickly, because we've got people in the room from St. Andrews and people that knew Nick. Nick's 1997 article. That's Nick Renger. Yeah, sorry, Nick Renger. Yeah, too many Nicks. Um, the ethics of trust in world politics. Nick, Nick identified that asymmetries of power as being a crucial thing, building on Annette Bayer, the feminist theorist's work, and the need to try and pull, um, do something about those asymmetries if you were actually going to have a genuine set of all trusting relationships. So, yeah. Um, so, Nick, Richie, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess my problem is that I don't think you can have trust in a system of nuclear deterrence, I think then I'd want to use the word confidence. So the, the nuclear, the nuclearists, the nuclear theologians, they've got an enormous level of confidence in the continuation of, the nu of nuclear deterrence. I don't think they're trusting in it because for me, that trusting requires that there be an interfer there be some relationship with another human agent and they're trusting in a system. So, 
it, it, it's a bit like, you know, do you trust the pilot on the plane or do you have confidence in the pilot? That kind of issue that keeps coming up in lots of these conversations. So I'm not sure that's trust, but whether I think though ideology, whether you can, I think whether you can have trust. So the bit I didn't answer to Ken when he asked me about structures and agencies, that even though I don't think the United States and the Soviet Union can trust each other in that sense, or China and the United States today, what I do think can develop and I, is cultures of trust. I think cultures of trust can develop, which, um, which, are, uh, in, which become highly institutionalized. I think that's what the United States and the United Kingdom have. We have two, we have this security community in which we have two deeply embedded cultures of, in which we have a culture of trust. It's deeply embedded in both societies. So it doesn't matter, Ken, who's leader ultimately, it can vary. But in the end, it's it's held up by that. So I think the the ideology point is a strong one, and the idea of habituation. And then there's a question about does it matter then that they share the same values? Now, Cory Sharkey in her book argues the reason why Britain and America didn't go to war at the end of the 19th century is because fundamentally they had this this shared foundation of common values. And so then, of course, we get into the question of well, what does that mean then if the liberal democracies are then engaged with the authoritarians? But that's for an, that's for we can pick that up. So that would be that one. Then then your question is really interesting. Um, yeah, I mean I'm reading at the moment. I'm nearly finished now. Uh, Graham Allison's Destined for War, and what I found really interesting is what my bedtime reading. What, what I found really interesting about it was that that she the the Xi's background in the Cultural Revolution. If Allison's correct. Uh, you know, she had an absolutely awful time in the Cultural Revolution that I would imagine left a legacy of not leaving yourself weak and exposed. You know, his sister committed suicide, according to Alison, because she couldn't cope with the awful conditions that she was living through. So, so I was very interested in that, that biography, and I was thinking about what would be the implications of that in a, in a nuclear crisis between, between China and the, the US and others. So, and then with Putin, of course, as well, the point you made about, you know, the crime infested neighborhood, the rat story and all of that, how much weight do we give to that? I, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting question about these things, but does that leave, if they've had those kind of upbringings, does that leave leaders deeply suspicious of relying on trust? If I can put it in those terms, does it mean that they're, that, but, but at the same time, you know, one of the things that I think is very interesting about all this, is that we, we do see a lot of interest in trust in Chinese society, Chinese thinkers, Chinese writers. There is a, I think there's a, it's something I wanna do more with actually, is to try and explore these different understandings coming out of Eastern philosophies of, of, of thinking about trust. So yeah, thank you. Maybe we could talk more about that. And then finally, uh, I think, is it finally? Yeah, Yan. Yan, yeah. Yeah, but surely, confident if you can increase the level of confidence coming back to what i was saying to catherine if you can increase the level of confidence surely that reduces your 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 subjective uncertainty if you've got these confidence and security building measures doesn't that i'm less I, I i'm i've got a lower degree of uncertainty and indeed coming back to your point about fear and anxiety it's less if i think that you can't get your tanks across my border as quickly because I've got these arrangements in place. So I'm not sure that you're right that it doesn't reduce uncertainty, but I agree, but I like the way, but I like your distinction there. Yeah, you're right. You argue in the in the in the piece with Vincent that 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 you can't um, calculate trust in that way. It's not a risk calculation for you. And 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 I think we we share that. Um, your final point about the box. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess what I wanted in the early 80s was an escape out of the box. Um, um, and I thought it was available to us and it was available to us. And Reagan and Gorbachev seized it. Um, whether there's an escape always out of the box, uh, I guess that's something that we have to explore in different conflicts and different situations. But what I'm clear about is that we have to always look for the possibility of an escape out of the box. Ken, that's a great, one at the end about deception is that then is is that the extreme version of monitoring uh and control though because the opposite what trust requires you to do is let go the control mechanisms it requires you to let go the monitoring 
ultimately it requires you, as I argue as in that book, it requires you to suspend risk calculations. Um, so this is where we agree, but Jan and I agree on this and Vincent, but we disagree on the referent. That's the fundamental difference. For me, it's interpersonal, for them, it's states. Um, but, but ultimately, what trust requires is that you, you're willing to accept vulnerability. This is the paradox of it, but the vulnerability isn't anxiety provoking for you. This is why the anxiety word is so powerful. And just last sentence for me on this. When John Hurt set all this up in 1950 with the security dilemma concept, he defined it, and this comes from the political psychology sort of engagement, he defined it really interestingly as the uncertainty and anxiety about the intentions of others. So from the very beginning, when, we, when he started thinking about this concept, he had anxiety at the heart of it. And what I, what I think trust is all about is embracing the uncertainty but not in, but not being but not having the anxiety and the fear so that you're so you're living in a space where you recognize it's uncertain it's not certainty the point laura was making yesterday about deterrence and abolition the drive to certainty you don't you don't go there you stay with uncertainty but it's not a fear and anxiety provoking uncertainty and that opens up a politics of trust that can be emancipatory and liberating Thank you. Great set of questions. Okay, thank you. Isla, can we have uh, 10 minutes extra for the break? So we come, well, I don't know. I'm asking Isla, she's in charge. Or do we come back? Do we are we here the other place? Okay, are we, are we meeting at, at half past? Or? Okay, we've got twenty minutes then. Um, I don't know about you, but at least sitting here, the last hour and a half passed very quickly listening to Nick, and I think uh, there are plenty more questions, uh, and Nick would have answered them uh, in continuingly in a very interesting, though not necessarily persuasive ways. <laughs> but it shows what a great issue, shows what a great issue this business of trust is and that it gets everywhere in international relations. And there are not many people doing it. And there are not many people who are dealing in trust with within international relations. So please show your report, your, your support to Nick in continuing to do this and bring it to us even if we don't really want too much of it. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Hey, it was great fun. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Um, deception, I think, is, 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 is it. Because if you can create a situation 